Okay, great. My name's Steve Judd. I'm uh, the chair of the Network Literacy Community of Practice, which is a part of the Military Families Learning Network, which is a learning network of uh, communities of practice organized by e-extension funded by the Department of Defense. Um, on those earlier slides you saw where you can find the Military Families Learning Network. I'll also tell you that if you did not uh, find out about this webinar there, you can also find us on Facebook, the Network Literacy page, and from there you can branch off and find most anything. Um, and one more housekeeping thing I would ask is the um, this webinar is obviously listed on the Extension Learn Network. I put a link up there, and if you would, I'd appreciate if you can go to that link uh, and indicate that you actually attended today. Um, you can sign in to learn either using your Extension ID, Twitter account, Facebook account. There are a number of different ways to, uh, to get in there, and um, it, again, it just helps us know who's participated and to follow up later if we uh, intend to do some evaluation. So today we're going to talk about online security and privacy, particularly um, Terrence Wolfork from Fort Valley State University is going to talk to us a little bit about online security and the use of passwords and such. And then we're going to follow that up with a walkthrough of the Facebook privacy settings and hopefully by the time you leave today's webinar you should feel comfortable um, going in and checking your own Facebook privacy settings uh, to make sure that what it is you intend to share is shared with who you intend to share it with. A little tongue twister to start off. Um, John, can you put up the first poll question and while you're doing that I'm I'd like folks to take a second and respond to this poll and at the same time I'm going to mute my microphone and let Terrence come in and take over the uh, early portion of this presentation. So All right. Thanks, Steve. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, Steve? Yes, I All can. Right. My All right. Just wanted to make sure. My name is Terrence Wolfwark, and I'm the coordinator of information and technology services at Fort Valley State University. I'm also the outgoing chair of the eight um, Southern Region PLN IT subcommittee, and I'm also the chair of the Association of the Extension Administrators IT Technology and Data Management Group. So, what I wanted to do today is kind of just go through a brief overview of security, being online security, and security tune-up. So, I'm going to start advancing the slides now. Now, if you ever had one of these days, you know, Charlie Brown is a good character. He normally never kicks the football whenever he's trying to. The kite always, the tree always eats his kite up. But today we live in a world today of online security, and none of us really want to stand out like the picture of Charlie Brown. The picture, though, depicts ink and paper, but today we're in the digital world with the Internet. The Internet is a shared resource and being safe online is a shared responsibility for all of us. We each have to be responsible for securing our own small part of the internet or our own small part of cyberspace. And that includes securing our wireless routers, securing our mobile devices, and securing our PCs that we use. So within the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to do a little small talk about the things that we do so that we can have a good day and not a bad day like the one Charlie Brown is having. So how to avoid one of those days? Well, we want to talk about three things during this part of the presentation. We're going to talk about how to defend your computer, how to protect personal data and sensitive information, and how to protect devices and data while you're away from home or while you're at, away from the office. These are three things that work pretty good, but you have to do all of them together and you have to do all of them, not just pick one or two, you have to do all of them. So first we're gonna talk about defending your computer. Most companies that we work with, they protect their data through either a network firewall or they use and they use some sort of enterprise antivirus software. 
This protects the company network and resources, but today what we're going to talk about is how to protect your own home resources and your home network. One of the first things that you can do is install all of the security updates. And we have a picture of Windows updates if it needs to restart your computer to finish installing important updates. This is something that we always want to go ahead and say, yes, let's go ahead and let it install its updates. This is our first line of defense, and it also includes installing your Windows updates. It includes installing your Microsoft Office updates or your Adobe Suite Connect updates. It also includes installing your browser updates, Firefox, Google Chrome, um, Internet Explorer. It includes installing all of the updates for that, too. It also includes installing antivirus and anti-spyware updates. What we want to recommend is that you use security software that updates automatically so that you don't have to manually go in and do it. You want to let your software update automatically. Also, whenever you see a pop-up that comes up and says, you know, we scan your computer, you need to buy this particular software so that it clean your computer. Don't usually do that. Don't I'm recommending that you don't do that. These are usually some scam messages, and what they want you to do is just um, buy this useless piece of software, and all this is going to do is collect your credit card information and say that it cleaned it up, but you never know where your credit card information has gone once you enter that information. Also, you have to realize that most antivirus software and firewalls, is good to use them, but they're not going to be 100% effective. You still have to help reduce the risk by being very aggressive about security. And another thing that's on here that I'm going to talk about is securing your wireless router. Your wireless router is what gives you access to the internet while you're at home using a wireless. One of the first things that we want to recommend is that you change the name of your router or the SSID, so which stands for the Service Set Identifier. The default SSID is assigned by the manufacturer so that Linksys default um, SSID is going to be called Linksys. Netgear is usually going to be called Netgear. So you want to change that name. You also want to change your router, but you don't want to change it to a name that's going to be Terrence Wolfhart Router, Terrence Wolfhart Routers, or you don't want to have your street address, or you don't want to have you know your birth date. You really don't want to change your SSID name to anything that includes any personal information about yourself. You want to change it so that it's something that's unique and it's something that won't be easily guessed by anybody that's trying to pass by and just log into your network. You want to also change the preset password that's on your router. For example, Linksys default password is usually admin and Netgear is usually called um, password. That's their default password. So you don't want to have, you want to change that password. You don't want to keep it being the same. When creating a password, you want to make sure that you keep something that's long and you want to make sure that it's strong also. You want to change it so that it won't easily be guessed by others. You want to use a combination of numbers, letters, symbols, and you don't want to use any of your website passwords for your SSID password. So don't use your Bank of America password for the same password that you have for your router's router. And another thing you want to also do is use a firewall. Firewalls, they kind of help keep hackers away from your computer and send out personal information without your permission. The next choice was to protect the sensitive data. Defending sensitive data is the most important area that I'll probably be discussing during this seminar. There are four basic strategies that we want to look at, and they are Think before you enter sensitive information on any website. Be suspicious, very suspicious of any attachment and links that come that you have that come through email. Know what phishing and scams and fraud look like, and you want to create strong passwords. So when we say think before you type. Before you enter, enter any sensitive information on any web form or any web page, look for two things. And the two things are highlighted in red. You see where it says HTTPS. You always want to make sure that it says HTTPS or either, sometimes they may say SHTTPS. 
HSHTTP. You want to make sure that it says that. That's a sign that it's a secure website. And you also want to look at the little red padlock, well, the padlock that's there. You want to make sure that you have a closed padlock. This means that the website has taken some kind of additional measures to help secure the information that you're going to um, enter, which it could include encryption and making sure that that information is encrypted and safe. Additionally, you should also ask yourself, do you trust the business that you're getting ready to put that information in? Is this just like we go to the Better Business Bureau? We want to make sure that this is a business that we do know of and we do trust before we enter any kind of credit card information. Credit, if you have to enter information online, credit cards are generally the best because they have a limit on how much you'll be liable for. And most of the time you won't be liable for anything if anything happens to it. But I would recommend not using any debit cards. I would also recommend that you don't send cash or you use any kind of wire transfer when you're shopping or purchasing anything online. Another precaution that you can take is to think before you click. Before you submit your name, your email address, or other personal information, we need to check the privacy of that information. Make sure that that information will be protected. You want to look at the website privacy policy, and this normally is going to tell you how that information will be used and whether or not the information will be distributed outside to any other organizations, whether or not that website is going to collect your information and sell it. So you want to make sure that you, know, you look at that website privacy policy. You want to make sure that when you're filling out the forms that is this information really necessary for the vendor, vendor to have to complete a purchase. Normally vendors have certain information that is required, but a lot of other additional information isn't required. What you want to do is make sure that you only fill out the required information. And some other the tips that you could probably do is maybe just use one particular credit card for online purchases and not use a lot of different ones. Next, we need to think before we click. You know, if we come in contact with a person with a cold or with a flu without thinking, and then, you know, you might catch that flu. Well, it's the same way in the digital world. If you click without thinking, you might catch it also. And the catching the it will probably be a computer virus. So what we want to do is be suspicious and aware of any emails and instant message attachments and links. If you click on a link to download the latest movie, you're probably going to catch something else. Or if someone sends you an email, and we see these on different um, websites and emails, you know, click here for the latest photos of Kate. You know, you're probably going to catch something that you really didn't want to catch. Viruses can hide in any email or website attachment. You, once you open one, you're going to probably download some spyware. And what the spyware is going to do is going to track the information that's on, that you put on your computer. So while you're putting your bank account information online or any other personal information, this spyware that's installed on your computer is going to send it back to whoever the criminal is. It then enables the criminal to collect, to collect your company or your personal information, record your account numbers and your passwords, and then it's going to start bombarding you with all these pop-up ads to buy, you know, buy this particular software or buy these particular things to clean your computer up. Messages on social sites. You know, just because a message says that it's from Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, doesn't mean that it always is. So you want to make sure that that message did actually come from that site. These messages that may not come from that site could contain viruses or they may be in trying to entice you to give out some of your personal information. And so what we want to do from here is just make sure that you remember, think before you click. It's the best practice into protecting your sensitive information. The tricks that make you click. You know, the cyber criminals, they become pretty smart about how to lure people into getting you to click or to open up an attachment and so one of the most common methods that they like to use is the phishing scams and phishing is the p-h-i-s-h-i-n-g these are emails that they send and they look like they're from real financial institution it could be like your bank of america or your chase it says they need some more information for you because your account has now been deactivated and they need some additional information for you to put in and a lot of times when we get this information, we're like, 
I never put that in from I never gave Chase my work email address. So how do they have now my email address? Uh, so you need to be suspicious of that. So instead of clicking on those attachments, you may want to go. You would want to go directly to Chase website or Bank of America website, or even just call the number on the back of the card and just ask them if there's a problem. But don't click on the links that come from through your email. They are usually um, what criminals have done is usually design some site and it actually looks like it's a Bank of America site or your credit card company site. And what they're trying to do is capture your account information, your username, and your password. And once they have that, you know, they can do pretty much whatever they want to do with your credit card. And we know how troublesome it is to try to get your information and how to correct the information. So to protect yourself, your mission is PH. You know, when we're alarmed, when you see an alarming message, we usually um, put our suspicions aside. You know, it usually tells us your account will be closed if we don't hear from you. A virus has corrupted our database. Please reconfirm your information now. But one of the things about all of these alarming messages, they usually they seem like they always have misspellings and grammatical errors. Um, we always get some of these Nigerian email scams where they say the surviving spouse of a former government official or royalty you know, they want to transfer a lot of money into your bank account if you just pay the fees or just help pay the taxes or just give some kind of earnest effort that you, you know, uh, you yourself are a trustworthy person. What they're really trying to do is get you to steal your steal your money. So you have to be careful about that. And if it also remember it where it says great deals, if a deal sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There are a lot of times where people would get checks. And, you know, all of a sudden a check comes from somewhere for a thousand bucks and, you know, you never did anything to um, receive it. And you go deposit into your bank account and your bank credits you with that amount. But then after a couple of days and that check is found to be counterfeit, you know, your money is gone. So you have to be careful about if the deal sounds too good to be true. It probably is. And then request for sensitive information. You know, um, the account numbers or help and transfer and funds. It's important to note that reputable companies don't send email and asking you for any sensitive information. Your um, credit card company or any bank company or any reputable company is probably going to contact you directly and or have you contact them or even um, send you a letter. But they're not going to normally just send it in an email saying we need some of your personal information so be careful about all of that information but those are the tricks that scammers and criminals will use to get you to divulge some of your sensitive information so i talked a little bit about how to avoid the bait you want to confirm first that with the sender that the email or the mess message is real you want to call the company you want to use the number on the back of your credit card and you want to just call the company and check with them and make sure that that information that the company is requesting that information. You also want to check, go to either um, Google or just do an online phone directory search and just check the number that they, the company has given you in the email. A lot of times companies will send you a email telling you to contact them, but that number could really be going to another call center somewhere in another country, even though it may say 800. It could really be routed to another country, so you have to be careful about that also. Also, when you want to um, check on a website, go directly to the website. If it's Bank of America and they send you an email, go directly to www.bankofamerica.com and see if you actually have that email in there. Or you know, if you have a bookmark, use your bookmark. And you also want to use a browser with safety features. Uh, Internet Explorer has what's called Smart Screen Filter. And then you have pop-up um, pop blockers that appear also on default by default on Internet Explorer. And if you ever get an email and you kind of question it, go visit a website that identifies scams. One of the most popular ones that I like to use is Snopes.com, www.snopes.com.
Hey, Terrence, this is Steve. I think we lost your audio there for a second. Let's see if we can get Terrence back on here. Oh, looks like he just dropped out. So I'm going to continue on uh, in lieu of Terrence while he tries to rejoin the meeting. Uh, it's one of those technical difficulties we deal with. Um, so if maybe a couple folks could just maybe type in the chat pod that they can hear me and make sure that my sound isn't missing as well. Okay, that'd be great. Um, so one of the things we talk about is passwords and um, I noticed that that poll at the beginning of the session uh, it looked like we had a pretty good mix of folks who use a different password for every single site or each site that they use and those that use a few passwords across a number of sites. One thing that I'll tell you up front is that there is a trade-off that has to be made all the time between convenience and security. It would be most convenient to use one username and one password for every site that you have uh, that you ever need to use. However, that would not be very secure. So the most secure thing is to have a different password for every site, but that's not necessarily convenient. So somewhere in the middle you need to make a compromise. There are tools available that will help you remember passwords so that you can use a different password for every site. Um, it's one of those things that if you are affiliated with an institution, you probably need to talk to your IT department about what is permitted or not within your institution. Um, but again, there are ways of keeping either encrypted text files or using applications like LastPass or something of that sort that will help you remember your passwords. The reason we want to use different passwords for each site is because if one site becomes compromised and our password leaks out, which again should not happen depending on how the site is storing the password but should your password to one site leak out we don't want that to be able to be used to access our accounts on other sites so we want to keep them a secret um, we want to change them fairly regularly uh, this will prevent the case where someone gets your password and is sort of eavesdropping on you not being malicious but they know how to get into your stuff and we want to make them strong so in this example, I would just ask, maybe you could type into the chat uh, the number next number or numbers next to the passwords that you feel are uh, strong passwords. So I see, I see a few, a bunch of choices there. A bunch of you seem to be saying three, four, and six or some combination thereof. And uh, we see that, you know, indeed, I'm not sure, three is marked not secure here, but I think it's relatively secure, um, except that it is a word. Some of these are, are words that are just sort of rearranged, and so that's not ideal. Uh, this is, um, if you sort of read this, uh, trying to translate some of the characters, it says expeditious, um, and it just takes and interchanges some of the characters for numbers or exclamation points. Probably not the most secure, although it's more secure than, say, a birth date um, or a phone number or other number. What we really want is we want a mix of characters numbers, punctuation marks, and upper and lower case, and we want them to be relatively long, and we want them to not be easily guessed by anyone else. Uh, Lila, oh, are you back, Terrence? I'm back. Yeah. You <laughs> okay. You said that I'm going to let you take over. All right, thanks. You say that correctly with three. Three is expeditious. And, you know, a lot of times we use a number for a letter. Uh, it's a little bit, like Steve said, it's a little bit better, more secure. But criminals aren't, you know, fooled by using a three or a zero for a O. Now, the ambulance, you know, that you, well, it looks like it was ambulance to me, but it really wasn't. But it uses a combination of capitals, letters, um, lowercase, symbols. And the number six, 
Number six, it was it is actually a sentence. The sentence stands for my son Andrew was three years old in December. So we use the first letter of each one of it to actually make a password. And you also use the um, upper and lower case and your numbers also. So that's how you want to do with your passwords. Next is protecting devices on the go. These includes our laptops, our flash drives, or USB drives, or our mobile phones. You want to make sure that your laptop or whatever device you have has the latest protection. You want to make sure make it part of your travel routine. You know, you want to update your laptop before you leave. You want to guard your devices just like your mobile phone. You want to lock it. A lot of times people have the telephone the cell phone, it's not actually locked. Um, you can lock any of your cell phones with a four-digit um, lock code. You want to make sure that you have that. You want to you don't want to hand carry any sensitive data. You know, whether it's your laptop, whether it's your thumb drive, you know, it's not worth the risk if you lose that information. A lot of times people find out about Apple's latest phone or Apple's newest gadget because someone has just left the their laptop at a bar or somewhere and somebody has found, collected that information or found that computer and they just went in and saw you know everything that Apple or whichever company is getting ready to bring out if you can you want to encrypt your information but remember that just because you encrypt your information or encrypt your data it's, it's just going to slow a little slow the access to the data it's not going to necessarily prevent a determined hacker from getting that data so if you don't have to carry it with you, don't carry it with you. And then you also, you have to be careful about using your flash drive in another computer. A lot of times when we're going off and we're doing presentations, we may go off and we stick our flash drive in someone else's computer and say, hey, let me get um, a copy of this file or can I do this presentation? A lot of times their computer may be infected also. So you have to be careful about where you put your flash drives or your USB drives in. Because once their, your flash drive is corrupted, or has a virus on it, then you take it back to your home, it could corrupt and ultimately get your computer also. So we need to be protect our physical devices while we're on the road. But we also have to be careful about while we're not on the road. Hey Terrence, I think we lost This is you. where we get to on the go wireless hotspots. Um, can you hear me? Um, you're sort of cutting in and out. All right. What we're talking about now is wireless hotspots. We want to make sure that when we connect, you know, connecting to the wireless hotspot, you can, it can be risky. McDonald's has Wi-Fi everywhere. Um, Starbucks has Wi-Fi everywhere. But you want to make sure that when you're connecting, that you are connecting safe. So you want to connect securely. You want to choose the most secure connection. Even if you have to pay the 995 or whatever for it, you want to make sure that you can um, use a secure connection to it. You want to know who you're connecting to. A lot of times people will use what's called honeypots. And what a honeypot is, it may set up as a free Wi-Fi hotspot. And you may think that, oh, all right, I can get free Wi-Fi. But actually what they're using is getting you connect to their Wi-Fi and they can get on and connect to your computer. So you want to make sure that you... You know, be careful. A lot of times, like Hilton Hotel, maybe HiltonHotel.net. Well, sometimes what they may do is leave the eye out, and your mind just instantly put that eye in there for Hilton, and that's how they capture you. You want to just be careful about and make sure that you know who you're connecting to, and you want to save sensitive views for more trusted connection. You really want to be careful about going online on a public open Wi-Fi. And here you are, you're downloading all your bank account information or any other financial transaction on a wireless hotspot. You don't want to download or install any updates while you're on a public Wi-Fi, unless you're kind of confident about that. But you just have to be real careful about it. And also, um, with all our cell phones, with all of our laptops, you can turn the Wi-Fi off. So when you're not actually using your Wi-Fi, turn it off when you're not using it. And sometimes, even despite our best efforts, you know, sometimes things do go wrong. So when things go wrong, you know, how do you know that something's going to infect it on your computer? 
Well, usually your computer is going to run a little bit slower. It's going to show you some kind of unusual behavior. It's going to crash. You know, your programs won't save. You know, a lot of different things is going to actually tell you that this is not, um, something is wrong with me. So if you're at your office, you want to contact your IT department and they have, you know, the latest software or the latest um, tools to clean it up. But if you're at home and it's your home PC or your personal computer, you want to use some of the free security checkups. Microsoft has Microsoft Safety Scanner. McAfee has McAfee Security Scan. Norton has Norton Security Scan. There are many antivirus companies that offer free security checkups. Of course, when you, they check it up, they want to make sure that you purchase their computer, purchase their software, but you know they will give you a free checkup just to let you know if something is going on. So we have we want all of the all of you to have these kind of better days. And here you have Charlie Brown is happy. In the last couple of minutes, we covered three ways to avoid having a bad day. You need to defend your computer, protect sensitive information, and protect devices when you're away from the office. Remember these tips and you should be all right. And that concludes my part, Steve. Hey, thanks, Terrence. I appreciate it. Um, John, would you be able to put up that second poll question and then we're going to get into uh, a little bit about Facebook privacy, which I think is a, another side of that coin. Um, but I do want to ask before we move into that if folks do have any other questions about security. It's a huge topic. Um, sometimes we're not even sure what the best questions to ask are. Um, and, and it's difficult for us to really go into everything here, but we tried to just hit some of the high points that you should be aware of. Um, so if you have some questions, you can put them in the chat pod and we'll try and answer them. Uh, in the chat pod, I did respond to a question that Leela had about, um, you know, sort of a utility for remembering passwords. And as I said in that, I'm reluctant to recommend one in particular because different um, institutions will have different policies. Um, regarding how they, you know, what you're allowed to use. And so you really need to check, you know, kind of what the institutional policy is, but there may that have uh, good recommendations. And on the Mac, you know, they have Keychain, which is a built-in app. And so there are a number of, of different ones out there uh, that, that have good reputations. Jerry asks, um, the poll question I put up uh, is uh, if you know what, two-factor authentication is and it, it would appear that um, you know the majority of folks don't and I don't blame you at all uh, the the concept behind two-factor authentication is that there is a factor that you know which would be your um, password all right so it's something that's kind of in your head and then that you have a second factor which is generally something that you have so it could be biometric you may have a laptop that requires you to swipe your finger and and get fingerprint before you um, are able to use it for folks in the in some of the military institutions uh, you actually have to have a special USB key that goes into your computer to prove that it's you in addition to the password um, and the other thing is two-factor authentication um, or there's there's some two-factor authentication tools that you can use for more um, more easily for websites I'll show you one of these in just a second so I'm going to um, Let's see if I can do this. And it's not going to work for me. Um, John, can you put up the second poll? And I am going to bounce out of this session and come back in because it's not letting me share my screen. So I will be right back. Steve, let me see if I can request screen share. Okay. Does that help? Uh, it's telling me I need to download uh, Connect Add-in, which I should have. And so I'm going to try connecting with Firefox. I'll be right back. Okay.
Anybody want to sing a song or hear me sing? Hey, John. All right, this is Terrence again. Another thing that I probably should mention on passwords, a lot of times we use these different strange combinations of passwords and we make it real secure, but then we type that password up under our keyboard or we attach it to our monitor. You know, we want to be, it's no good to have the strongest passwords, but then we put it right up under our keyboard. I, you know, I deal a lot with fixing people from PCs, and a lot of times I ask them, well, I need you to put your password in, and they'll tell me, it's up under the keyboard or it's attached to the monitor. You know, that's not being secure also. I'm still not, Stephen hadn't joined us back yet. There he is. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Let's see if this will work now. All right, so we talked about um, two-factor authentication. And John, let's see if I close that poll. And it's not letting me do that again. Hey, um, I probably have too secure a browser. Hey, John, can you do you mind sharing your screen and just uh, pulling up Facebook real quickly? And I'll just walk through from your screen. You'll just have to be my puppet. And you can just pull up uh, Facebook and go right into your secure into your uh, account settings if you don't want us to see your friends. Yeah, there's so, no problem because it's not letting me share either. Yeah, so no one's able to share. So let me. Uh, It seems to be a problem we're having with Connect. Well, let me talk about a few things here. Maybe, John, if you want to okay. play around. Can you try closing yeah, all these okay. polls and hiding them? And um, But I want to talk for a couple minutes. The, um, so two-factor authentication. Um, Again, you have this factor that you have in addition to what you know. So I have this set up for both my all of my Google accounts, but also for Facebook. Um, within Facebook, there are two ways of doing it. One is if you have an application on your phone, the Facebook application, it can generate a special code for you. So the idea is that in, in addition to having to know your password to Facebook, um, you would also need to have my phone with the application in order to get in if you're trying to log in from a device that you haven't used before. So I could give you my Facebook password or I could give you my Google uh, password and you will not be able to log in just by knowing the my username and password. You also need to have that second factor. Um, you can also, some services allow you to do this via text message, so uh, some, uh, many of the banks allow you to do this now. So when you go, first try and log in from a new device, um, when you try and log in, it will send you a text message with a special code that you need to enter in. So that's one security feature that you can uh, utilize within Facebook and that will then um, kind of make it easier for you to to feel comfortable that no one else is sort of impersonating you or logging into your account. Uh, within Facebook, if you go to your um, account settings, 
Uh, there's a, an entry for security and the, that's called login approvals. And again, you can choose to either have a text message sent to you before you're able to log in from an unknown computer, or you can use the code generated by the Android or the iPhone Facebook app. Uh, the other thing that you can turn on for, and I'm sort of talking about security right now, and then we'll talk a bit about Facebook privacy, which I think is important. Um, the login notifications so that each time you are logged into Facebook from an unknown device or unknown location, um, it will send an email to the account the, to the email that you have on record so that or a text message so that you will know that uh, someone has logged into your account if it's you you can ignore it if it's not you then it's something you need to worry about and then finally is to turn on secure browsing and what that does is it forces when you go to Facebook um, that by default it will go to HTTPS uh, colon slash slash facebook.com instead of to the non-secure version. Um, this is pretty much on by default now uh, because in the past there were issues where if you were on an open Wi-Fi access point anyone could impersonate you on Facebook because they'd be able to see your um, be able to kind of steal a cookie and impersonate you online. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think are the most important privacy settings for you to go into. Um, we'll see if John's able to get uh, screen sharing on because I know it's a lot easier if, if I can uh, show you this stuff instead of just talk about it. But I do want you to um, at least be aware of it um, you know, going forward. And then we may end up trying to do this again where we focus just on Facebook privacy and can do a walkthrough. Um, so again, it, when you're in Facebook, if you look in the upper right, you'll see a drop down arrow and you can choose either account settings and that's where you can go into security or you can go into privacy settings. When, once we go to our privacy settings, and I'm going to make sure I pull this up here so that I'm seeing the same thing. There's a drop down arrow, we go to privacy settings. The first thing you see is default privacy. And there are three options, public, friends, and custom. So if you choose public, it means that for most things that you post to your timeline, um, those are going to be public by default unless you change them. Uh, your other options are to, to lock it down a little bit more closely, which is friends. Um, and that's sort of the most, or you know, one of the most restrictive forms in that it means that only your friends will be able to see it, not their friends, etc. And then the third option is custom. And custom is where you can sort of go wild within Facebook and choose, you know, only certain lists. You can exclude your view from certain people. Um, and additionally, a feature that Facebook added, which is important for privacy, is that you can, as you create a post, you can post it only to a given list. Um, so if you haven't, I'd like to see kind of in your, in the chat area there, uh, maybe just a quick yes or no. Yes, if you have created lists within Facebook. And no, if you have not created lists within Facebook. Okay, so it looks like we have a pretty good mix. Um, and looks like we got somebody, Brian, is able to share his, uh, his Facebook account. So Brian, if you click on that arrow up in the upper right next to home and select privacy settings. Okay, there we go. And here's where I'm talking about that you have three default options, public, friends, and custom. Now, if Brian clicks on the custom, what we're going to see is this is where we can be very specific, where we can say make um, these posts visible only to people on a certain list. And so by default, that's his friends list, which is sort of a, a global list of everyone get, that gets added. But you're also able to narrow that down. And so for instance, in mine, I have a families li uh, family list, which would only be people that I'm 
related to. I have uh, friends, I have a uh, uh, work group, and that way I can, when I make a post, I can decide, well, I only want to share this with my family. I don't want to have to share it with everyone. In general, and this is, I'll give you a rule of thumb that I try and go by. In general, I do most things publicly because I recognize that even if I share something uh, privately with a small group, they can always uh, share that out wider than I originally intended. When I think about privacy, the way I think about it is what we're trying to do is make sure that information is shared in the way that we intended to share it. All of these, you know, when we're talking about Facebook, we're talking about intentionally sharing information. But what we want to do is sort of limit that to who we intended to share it with. There's always a way around it because once I've shared it with anyone, they can take and take a screenshot, do whatever to get out to a wider group of people. So I, my rule of thumb is don't share anything with anyone <laughs> unless you're willing to have it be public. If you're not willing to eventually see that in public, um, probably you shouldn't share it to begin with. That's my rule of thumb. So in this custom privacy setting, you can see where you can also restrict it so you can hide things from specific people or lists. This will apply to your defaults and you are then able to change it within each posting. So if you, you can just click on cancel that, Brian, that would be great. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple things. When we look at how you connect, if you click on the edit settings next to how you connect. Um, one of the things that you may want to change here, and as I mentioned, this is about what your expectation of privacy is. Not There's not necessarily a right answer or a wrong answer. Um, so I, I'll, t I'll talk about how I may have things set up. If you want to use Facebook to connect with people, then it is useful to allow them to find you by your email address or phone number. It doesn't mean that they can see it. It means that if they search for you, base, you know, they have your email address already and they search for it, they'll be able to find you. So I can leave that at everyone. Who can send you friend requests? Uh, I usually leave that at everyone because you know, it could be someone that I don't have any real connection with except in real life, and I want them to be able to find me online. Now, the last one is who can send you Facebook messages? And honestly, on that one, I crank that down a bit. So if Brian clicks on that, he would see that he has options. And I generally say only my friends can message me on Facebook. Um, I honestly don't use messaging much on Facebook um, and I don't really feel a need to get messages from people that I don't know already or even friends of friends who are you know I may or may not know so I restrict that to friends but again each of these is going to be up to you but that is definitely one that I would check and make sure that it's set in the way that you expect and, and want so that you don't start you know log into Facebook and all of a sudden you have these messages popping up and People do use this for a um, for a scam, if you will. So people will send, you know, if, if someone compromises someone else's Facebook account, you'll start getting Facebook messages that say, I'm stranded in London and I need $121.52 in order to get my plane ticket home. Would you be able to wire that to me? And it will appear to be from someone you know. So even when you are dealing with that, you want to make sure that uh, you're, you're dealing with someone that you actually know and not uh, someone whose account has been compromised. So Brian, you could click on done there. I see Tashara has a question um, on, on her Facebook. There's a fourth option on how you connect. Who can look up your timeline by name? And that has to do um, with the the sort of new view within Facebook is the timeline view as opposed to the old uh, older wall view and um, it just has to do with people being able to search with search for your timeline simply by your name not by your email address or by your phone number so it's a little more public and we can we can uh, look at that as well 
if you can click where it's uh, that's under the timeline and tagging now so if you click on edit settings there Brian you'll see who's allowed to post on your timeline yeah friends is pretty good who can see what others post on your timeline you can make changes to that um, and then a couple more that I just want to mention it and um, one of these I actually put a post on Facebook today about and so I don't know if, if people actually looked at it so um, people can post on your timeline you can decide whether you uh, review those posts before they go on your timeline or not you can always go back in and edit them after the fact or take them off your timeline after the fact but you may decide if, if um, that you just don't want anyone putting something on your timeline unless you have viewed it and approved it first so you can do that here with that saying review posts friends tag you in before they appear on your timeline and you can modify that now you'll see some of this stuff that uh, you know Facebook tries to get you to to do a more public view or we'll show you here's what's going to happen when you do this when you go to your timeline you're going to get these approval request messages so you can just click back here Brian and not actually change these settings right now um, you can also change that if you've been tagged in a post on your timeline who's able to see it you can you know do these reviews for a number of things the last item in the list and I'm trying to go through this fairly quickly because of the little technical snafu we had is that um, photos if someone uploads a photo and they're your friend and you look like a face in that picture so it could be you or it could just be poor facial recognition um, if you appear in that picture by default that your friend is going to have your name suggested to them so that they can tag you in the photo that may be fine with you it may not be maybe you don't want to be tagged in people's photos they'll still be able to tag you explicitly um, but you wouldn't be suggested to them so Facebook if you try and change that Facebook's gonna tell you well you know this is meant to be a convenience feature for your friends so that they can easily tag a whole bunch of photos but you need to make the decision about what your expectation of privacy is on Facebook and how you might be able to you know you can change that so you can make it so that you're not suggested at all to anyone that you're suggested to be friends of your friends um, again a variety of options for you to choose so if you can click on done there, Brian, I want to hit just a couple other high spots. And please, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and put them in the in the chat pod. Or if you have suggestions on uh, other settings that I've um, skipping over or missing that you think are critically important that people look at. If you can click on edit settings next to the ads, apps, and websites. Okay. Um, you can change the settings about how you are seen publicly so if you look down there Brian where it says public search and edit settings okay right now because this is uh, public search is enabled it means that if I go on to say Google or Bing or whatever search engine you use and search for Brian Webster um, his Facebook profile can come up in a public search so if that's something that he does not want to come up in public he just click off enable public and then you know of course they want you to confirm that because you know they want to make sure that you are visible publicly but now it's Brian has changed that so now if you do a search um, he won't come up in a public search and if you go back to apps Brian Brian actually has um, platform disabled and that's you know sort of this Facebook integration um, you can if apps are turned on you have some more settings here that influence how Facebook is integrated with third-party applications and third-party websites um, such that you know if you go to say uh, Pandora or Rotten Tomatoes as soon as you go there unless you've changed your settings it's gonna say oh welcome Brian Webster how are you and did you know that your friends liked this movie and you may like that movie um, so it can be if that's not the behavior that you want you need to go into um, 
this section and change that. But again, Brian's not seeing it because he doesn't have apps actually turned on, which is fine. It, it actually makes it even, um, it's not an issue at all. And there are also settings in here to influence ads because by default, you may see an ad when, if, if I haven't changed my settings, you'll see, you may see an ad that says Steve Judd likes, uh, you know, Diet Coke and Mentos or something. Um, if you're my friend and I happen to have somehow indicated in Facebook that I like uh, that particular product page, um, you'll never see it. So you don't know it happens, but your friends will see it. And so you can go in and actually modify that behavior. So again, if you go into privacy, ads, apps, and websites, and you have your pl Facebook platform enabled, uh, you can change those settings within ads. And one last thing I want to show you, and then we'll let you go is down where it says blocked people and apps if you click on manage blocking um, here you are actually able to go ahead and block uh, particular people you're able to block specific applications you know so if you're not into farmville and you don't want to see you know get invitations from people play farmville you can just block the entire application um, if some of your friends, you sort of want to keep them, you know, um, on your friends list. You don't want to insult them, but at the same time, you don't necessarily want them to know what's going on. You can add them to your restricted list, and then they'll only see items you post which are public, um, not on your friends list, and they'll also see other items if you're in specific groups together. Um, so you, you are able to block people. You're able to block applications and you're also able to block event invitations so if you start getting spammed you can use this as a way you know if you don't really want to go to the effort if you don't want to unfriend someone you're afraid what that means socially on the outside of Facebook in real life if you will um, there are ways to sort of surreptitiously block them such that you are not inundated with their requests so I apologize for the sort of uh, technical snafu. I appreciate that Brian was able to hop in here out in Iowa and share his screen with us so that we were able to, to go through and see some of these privacy settings. I would ask um, that folks put in the chat, um, maybe if they have any questions or in particular, um, if you would be interested in seeing a bit of a smoother presentation on Facebook privacy settings, we can certainly reschedule that. So if you would um, like to go more in depth on this in a time when I'm able to share my screen and walk through the way it was intended, just say, yes, do it again, or something to that effect. And I'll, I'll see what we can do to schedule that. Or you can certainly comment on our Facebook page. Um, as I mentioned before, it's, uh, I'll just post it into the chat again in case you, in case you need that. Um, you can, you can certainly put it on there. Um, you can ask us on Twitter, Google Plus, we're reachable a number of different ways, or you can email me, um, directly if you have any questions or concerns. And again, I apologize that technically we didn't have the best luck today. And uh, I think we can do this again if that would be s suitable to people. So I don't see any specific questions coming in. Um, so I just want to thank you for your time today. And please look in your email um, because we probably will follow up with uh, an evaluation in uh, a week or so. And uh, I understand there was some technical problems, but we would really appreciate your feedback and uh, ideas about what other topics you might be interested in the future as well. So thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of the afternoon. Let me ask if you haven't already, click on the link to go to the learn.extension.org slash events slash 645 to indicate that you attended and add thoughts and comments in there and we can continue the conversation over there. Thank you.